Hi, welcome to our lesson on action potentials and compound action potentials. I'm Zach. I'm Allison. And I'm Jamie. I'm going to start us off. Your nervous system consists of billions of interconnecting neurons. Everything in your body, from running to sleeping, requires neurons to communicate with each other. We're going to focus on this communication, which happens via action potentials. Action potentials allow neurons, as well as groups of neurons, to pass information, similar to making a phone call or a conference call. When a neuron is not actively communicating, it's referred to as being at rest. It is important to understand the neuron at rest in order to understand what happens during an action potential. So gradients, or the difference in concentration or charge between two areas, are very useful for understanding the neuron at rest. Of particular interest will be the difference in charge due to ions, and ions are just charged particles. The examples that we're going to be using in this case are sodium, which is abbreviated as Na, and potassium, which is abbreviated as K. Both of these are plus one, but you can write it either as positive one or just as a positive and the one is assumed. The direction of flow can be thought of as the path of least resistance, like a river flowing downhill. In the case of charges, opposites attract, and so positive ions will flow from areas of more positivity to less, i.e. positive ions don't like each other, they want to get away from each other. Likewise, negative ions will flow towards areas of more positive charge, so the negative ions think the positives are pretty cute, they want to be over there. Um, so this can be seen better if we actually look at some gradients. So this first gradient is just a concentration gradient. Essentially, we can see that there are clearly less of whatever this is on the outside of the cell than there are on the inside of the cell. Now, I've depicted this as a membrane with the bilayer clearly shown and this as some sort of protein channel within the membrane. Later on, you're going to see these depicted as just a straight line, and even sometimes these are just gonna be straight lines in that membrane, especially when we show you different neurons. So in order for these to get out of the crowded space and go where they wanna go, this has to be open. And so sort of just by probability, these are going to end up going outside where they have more elbow room, if you will. In the case of the neuron, it's more important to talk about charge gradients. So if we go over here, you can see that I've drawn that same membrane, and this now is actually going to be an ion channel, which allows charged particles to flow. So there's definitely more negative on the inside and more positive on the outside. So for this to be true, this would have to be closed. If this were open, it's very intuitive that the negatives would flow out of the cell and the positives would want to flow into the cell. And this is actually exactly the case with a neuron. So as you can see here, there are more positive charges outside of a nerve cell than there are within, and there's more of a negative charge within the nerve cell. And it's also interesting to note that there's much more potassium on the inside than there is on the outside, and there's much more sodium on the outside than there is on the inside. So like, there's a little bit of sodium in here, and I suppose to be totally accurate, there's a little bit of potassium out there. So in order to talk about this charge difference, it's also really important to think about voltage. Voltage is just a more specific term for a gradient referring to charges. So voltage is the difference in charge over a given distance. So when something is happening in the neuron, generally we're going to be calling it an action potential, as I've said, and this will involve sodium flowing into the cell, and then potassium after that is going to flow out of the cell, and these end up balancing each other. Um, Allison will tell you more about this, and she's actually going to give you some really nice graphs to explain what I've just said about the direction of flow and why this makes sense for an action potential. Now that we've learned what action potentials are and what a neuron is like at rest, we can look at how an action potential happens. 
So if we stuck a really small electrode inside of a neuron and measured the voltage during an action potential, it would look something like this. Normally, a neuron is at rest at about negative 70 millivolts. Um, and there are three major steps to the action potential, depolarization, repolarization, and then hyperpolarization. So we'll go through these steps um, individually and figure out how an action potential actually happens. So during depolarization, a neuron is receiving signals from either its neighboring neurons or outside stimuli. And these signals are telling a neuron to either fire or not fire. To fire, a neuron must depolarize or become less negative. So if we were measuring its voltage, it would be moving up on the graph. If they get signals not to fire, the neuron will hyperpolarize or become more negative. If the neuron gets enough signals to depolarize, the voltage will reach threshold. And that is the point at which an action potential begins. If the membrane potential does not reach threshold, then an action potential will not occur. Once threshold is reached, ion channels in the membranes that are sensitive to the voltage will open up, which will allow sodium ions to flow in. Since these are positive ions, the membrane potential in the side of the cell continues to become more positive, as you can see here. Soon after the sodium ion channels open, potassium ion channels will also open. Because the inside is now more positive, the potassium ions will flow out of the cell, causing the inside of the cell to become more negative again. So as you can see here, the voltage will start to fall. Additionally, the sodium ion channels will deactivate, which means that sodium will no longer flow in or out of the cell. At this point, the sodium ion channels cannot open again until the cell returns to its resting potential which prevents another action potential from occurring. This is called the absolute refractory period. You may be wondering, what is a refractory period? This is a period of time in which another action potential cannot occur. This prevents our neurons from firing all the time. Finally, the potassium gates will continue to stay open and potassium will continue to flow out, making the inside of the cell even more negative than its normal resting potential, as you can see here. This hyperpolarization makes it even harder for the neuron to fire again because it's even farther from threshold. This is also called the relative refractory period. Finally, the membrane potential will return to rest and the neuron will be ready to fire again. Although this process seems really complicated, it actually only takes a few thousands of a second, which means that your neurons can do this tens or hundreds of times in one second. But now that we know all about how action potentials work, we can learn more about them from Zach. Allison just showed us that membrane voltage must reach a certain value for the action potential to fire. And that number is called threshold. In this diagram, threshold is represented by the dotted line. If you don't reach this number, no action potential occurs and it returns to rest. But if you do reach threshold, it triggers an action potential. And the same one occurs every time threshold is reached. This is called an all or nothing response. Either the entire action potential happens because threshold was reached, or no action potential happens because threshold was not reached. Remember, action potentials help us sense our environment. However, if an action potential is all or nothing, and the same action potential occurs every time, regardless if there is a weak or strong sensation, how can a person tell the difference between a loud or a soft noise? Well, think about the beeping of a metal detector. It beeps very slowly until you near metal, and then it starts beeping much faster. Just like a metal detector, the strength of a sensation influences the rate of action potential firing. So, strength of the sensation equals the rate of firing. A strong sensory experience, like a loud noise, will cause neurons to fire at a faster rate than a weak sensory experience, like a soft noise. The action potential itself stays the same, that the rate of firing matches the strength of the sensing. For a nerve to send signals to and from the brain, the action potential we have described must be able to travel down the neuron. As we discussed earlier, sodium rushes in when memory potential reaches threshold. When this positive sodium rushes in, that causes the neighboring areas to also become positive. Then that triggers their own action potential and more sodium rushes in. As you can see, it just continues down the line. As sodium rushes in, this helps the neighboring areas reach threshold, and that allows the, the action potential to travel down the neuron. This is much like uh, 
knocking down one domino. Once you start the first, all the rest go down the line. So uh, reaching threshold in one area causes the next area to reach threshold and thus the action potential travels. So far we have only looked at a single action potential firing in a single neuron. However, we have billions of neurons working together in our body, so we often measure the signals based on the responses of large groups of neurons. This is called a compound action potential, and it measures all of the action potentials of neurons in a particular area. Because a compound action potential reflects the sum of many neurons, its properties are different from that of a single action potential. The compound action potentials we record do get bigger or smaller, depending on the strength of its sensation. So, a strong stimulus will give us this big compound action potential, while a weak stimulus will give us a, a smaller compound action potential. They are not all or nothing. However, if an individual neuron still gives an all or nothing response, how do compound action potentials have different levels? Well, not all neurons have the same threshold value. The size of a compound action potential is based on the number of neurons firing. With a stronger sensation, more neurons reach threshold, and the summed compound action potential is bigger. So overall, we have just discussed how a single action potential fires the same way every time when memory potential reaches threshold. It is all or nothing. Information about the strength of a sensation is given by the rate of neuron firing for a single, compound, or for a single action potential, and how many neurons are firing for a compound action potential. Action potentials can spread down a neuron because when one area reaches threshold, the neighboring areas become positive enough to reach threshold and start their own uh, action potentials. Just like when one domino falls, the next fall in line. The action potential just moves down a line, reaching threshold as its neighboring areas reach threshold. We hope you enjoyed this lecture on action potentials and compound action potentials, and that you have fun with the following lab. Welcome to our, our lesson on compound. <laughs> Try to flow uphill. That would be nuts. I will start that over. I have also called the route. Yeah. Nope, this is even worse. Oh, oh, I was already filming. Oh, sorry. I thought you were looking at me. <laughs> I was just going over here. Mm -hmm. No, we have neurons working together. Mm -hmm. Okay. It triggers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>